and we're going to learn about Jesus. Time out. I know you're like, well, isn't that what we preach about every Sunday? Let's be real. Most preaching that you hear is around Jesus. It's about how you can be blessed or how you can grow or how you can, you know, um, get over, how you can stun on your haters, how you can do all these things. But the reality is most preaching in American Christianity has very little to do with Jesus. And what happens is we think it's okay that if we don't, if we preach about everything but Jesus at the end, to say who wants to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. But it is not the preaching of anything other than the preaching of Jesus that causes men to be saved. The Apostle Paul, who wrote some of the most amazing things, he said it is the foolishness of preaching that confounds the wise. And it is this method and this power of preaching that converts souls. It puts a conviction, let me slow down, in the hearts of men that makes them realize that they are in need of a savior. You are not in need of another self-help message. You are not in need of another song. You are in need to know about the man named Jesus. And the reason why we have to preach and teach this, the reason why I want to preach and teach this this month is because if you know him, if you know the depths, the breadth, and the detail of who Jesus is, Yeshua, Amashia, he is Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, when you know him, there won't be anything or anyone able to convince or persuade you otherwise. And the reason why this is imperative, because he is the chief cornerstone. He is the foundation of our faith. He is the reason that we are able to be named among those who are in right relationship with God. So somebody say Jesus. That's who we're talking about today. And I want you to get ready. I want you to take notes. I want you to, uh, I really want you to meditate on what I'm getting ready to say to you today. And all throughout this month, I want you to get somebody to get to the church to hear these messages about Jesus. Um, because I believe that they are going to, they're going to recalibrate. They're going to center. And they're going to focus the heart of this church. I'm going to get into the word. Now, this is all my disclaimers. Do you not realize there are churches, and I want you to see what I'm doing, putting it in quotes, that gather every week. What we were just doing 20 minutes ago, shouting and running, and I love to do it, they do that. They lift up their hands and they sway and they worship. But they don't all believe that Jesus is who he said he was. We live in an age of humanism and secularism. What is humanism? Where it's just like it sounds. It's man-centered. It's all about benefit, benefiting me. How is this beneficial? This is why we are an. In, this is why America is an entertainment-driven church. And I have to be cautious because I believe that he that wins souls is wise. And so I believe in all of these things. But if you have all the bells and whistles but you lack meat, once again, you're not a church. So I want to ensure that we as a people are rooted and grounded in the foundational truth of who Jesus is. He was not just a prophet. He was not just a teacher. He is not a truth. You know what irks me? I'm going to preach. It's when somebody says, well, that's their truth. There is not their truth. There is not my truth. There is only one truth. Somebody said, there's only one. Come on and do it like I asked you. Somebody, you got to do it like this. There's only one. There is only one truth. Every truth that the believer is uh, supposed to ascribe to flows from the place of Jesus. We don't take our truths, our cues from the world. We don't take our cues from any other self-help gurus. We take our cues and our truth from Jesus. So we're going to be preaching and teaching on Jesus today. I want you to go with me to, we're going to read a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15. After we do 1 Corinthians 15, I'll tell you a verse when I get there. We're going to do the book of John, starting at the first chapter. Hallelujah. I'm going to start it out like this. We went on a missions trip last year, and I, I have not shared this story because I knew I would share it at an appropriate time. Uh, I, I, I encountered, there were so many happy children there. We had about 15 people, and, 
And they lived literally, this is not us being demeaning or American, they literally lived in the garbage dumps. But they had so much joy, they had so much happiness. And there was one little girl, she stood out to me. She was happy when we were in the little compound. She just, something was about her. She stood out, she danced, she leaped, she was happy, she was jump roping. And I asked the pastor who ran the mission, I said, well, what's her name? And honestly, I don't remember her name, but I remember the story that he told her. He's like, an American, a group from America came and they adopted her. And they left her with, they, they gave her a teddy bear. They left her with pictures of their home. They left her with pictures of her family. And ever since then, she carries these pictures around with her everywhere she goes. Even though her circumstance that's present is not ideal, even though she lives still in the dumps, she knows that there is a home in a family that is waiting for her. And I feel that that is an appropriate method and a message for us. Though we live in a world that is stained by sin, though we live in circumstances that are not quite ideal, we are figuring this out, but we have a picture of our family that's not even of this world. And he is our template. He is our picture. He reminds us that we've been adopted into a family that is not of this earth. And so that picture of Jesus the Christ, it gives us hope that this world, that we're just passing through this world. Before I, read, before I even start reading the scripture, I want to say this. Jesus Christ is the perfect picture of God. Write that down. Jesus Christ is the perfect picture of God. Just as this little girl carried her photo, we have Jesus. Want to know how God feels about the sick? Look at Jesus. You want to know what angers God? Look at Jesus. Does God ever give up on people? Does he stand up for the people? Look at Jesus. We find our answers in Jesus. The scripture says he is the sun that it radiates. He is the only expression of the glory of our God. And he is the exact, somebody say exact. He is the exact representation and perfect imprint of his father. That's Hebrews 1 and 3. He is the exact representation of his father. This is why he is more than a prophet. He's more than a teacher. He is more than a good luck charm. He is not a genie in the bottle. Jesus is the exact representation of God. He is God manifested in the flesh. Let's read the scripture. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15 first. We'll start at the first verse. It says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. He says, This message or this mis message or this gospel that I preached into you, you, you decided to believe in it. Somebody say, I decided to believe it. This walk that we live, it is a decision. It is a, we come to a conscious revelation or a conscious understanding that we are in need of a savior. So therefore we believe and we receive this message or this gospel that's been preached to us. Third verse, for I delivered to you as a first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. My God today, that just stirs me up. And that he appeared to Cephas and the twelve. Pause. What the apostle Paul is doing right now is he's building his credibility about the gospel he preaches. He's saying that, yes, Jesus walked the earth, Many tried to disclaim that he rose from the dead. There was much scandal around it. There was much conspiracy around it. And they're saying, no, his disciples, they rolled the stone away. Pause for revelation. Do you not know that the stone of the tomb was not rolled away so that Jesus could get out? Why do I say that? Because after he raised, he was just walking through doors. 
The disciples were closed in a room, locked in fear, and Jesus would just appear in the room without the doors being open. That stone was not rolled away so he can get out, but it was rolled away so that the disciples can get in. Jesus makes every way possible for his sons and daughters to come into the understanding that he is who he says he is. So he'll roll stones away. He'll roll trials away so that you can see whew, that he is Jesus, the Christ, the son of the living God. So he says he appeared to Cephas and to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Verse 8, this is very important. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. Somebody say, by his grace, I am what I am. The apostle Paul says, I am the least of these. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church. But Jesus even showed up to me. This goes to show you that there is not a discriminatory bone in Jesus' life that he will discriminate to those whom he shows up to. The Apostle Paul says, I killed people in the church, and yet he still showed up to me. You may not have killed anyone. I don't know who I'm standing in front of. If you did, don't tell me. I'm a mandated reporter. But he'll even show up to you. Some of you are in the, are in the dumps and the dredges of life. He'll even show up to you. Some of you are in situations that you never thought you would find yourself in. But Jesus, the same one who rose from the dead, appeared to the disciples, appeared to Cephas, appeared to over 500 men, appeared to James, and even appeared to a murderer by the name of, of, of Saul, who's now known as Paul. He will even show up to you. And he says, by the grace of God, because that's the only way he showed up to me. Is there anybody in this church that knows it's by his grace? That is the only reason he would show up in my life. That is the only reason why he will still call me. Let me, let me read and not just, I, I'm ready to preach. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me, whether then it was I or they, so we preach so that you would believe. Let's keep reading. 12th verse. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is good. Where's the scripture? It says, our preaching is what? In vain. He says, if he has not been raised from the dead, our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that, he, that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. Last verse. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. The Apostle Paul had to build an understanding that the... The mere life of Christ and his raising or his overcoming of death, hell, and the grave is the, the, the milestone or the benchmark or the thing that we build our faith on. It is the thing that lets us know that we are victorious in him because he overcame death, hell, and the grave. And he says, if this is a lie, our faith is worth nothing. 
our preaching is useless and you are still in your sins. He says the truth, I, I, I dare to say there is something we call the incarnational presence of God. That is a theological term that means that God came from heaven and he lived among men. And we know that this birth defied every natural law. He was born of a virgin. He, he came from heaven, born of a virgin by the Holy Spirit, lived among men, healed the sick, raised the dead. He opened up blind eyes in deaf ears. We know the virgin birth. It defied all natural law. But I say the greatest thing is not the virgin birth. It is the resurrection. That's just my opinion. The res Why is it the resurrection? Because the resurrection of Jesus, he, who, even though he had resurrected several people from the grave, Lazarus and Jairus' his daughter, those two had to die again. Jesus rose from the dead and never succumbed to death again. And so it is the power of resurrection that, it, that has endued or endowed us with the power from on high. When he came up, he says, all power is in my hands. He had the keys to death and hell. And he didn't just rise with those keys. He didn't ascend back into heaven with those keys. What did he do? He gave those same keys to the 12 and to the men and women that he decided. He says, "Here, these keys belong to you. It is the resurrection of Christ from the grave that gave us our authority and our power. Let's read John 1. Why am I reading John 1? Because John, the Gospel of John, he doesn't start at his birth. He starts at the beginning of his origin. God has no origin. God is, he just is. He just always existed. And the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was, old, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. I'm going to go all the way to the 18th verse. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Speaking to the eternal truth of who Jesus is. When Jesus came on the scene in the New Testament, that was not the beginning of his existence. That's just when he showed up in the earth. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. This is key right here. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made known to us through the revealing of Jesus. As we are people known by the man that we serve, I pray that these next few weeks that the hero of all history would talk personally to you. Because if the gospel is not personal, it's nothing. The gospel is preached and it meets you, even as the Apostle Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians 15, that even me, the least of these, one who was not worthy to receive the seeing Jesus, he even came to me in a very personal, real way. So I pray that there is a fresh revelation and revealing of who Jesus is to us, the body of Christ. It is not our witty inventions. It is not our strategies or our church planting schemes that lets the church of God grow. It is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you, the scripture says that there's only one way to come to God. 
Jesus, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. If any man comes any other way, he is a thief and a robber. You might not get too many self-help notes out of this today, but I don't care. The only thing I'm concerned about today is that you know Jesus. He says, I am the only way to get to salvation. And in a day and age where it seems like the church has lost its spine and we acquiesce to the truth and the beliefs of all of these other things that sound so appealing, that sound so attractive, but it lacks the power to transform, we have to stand on the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. How many people remember the day? My mother, she used to do this rap. I remember the day, and I remember it well. I ain't going to tell the rest. When you accepted Jesus, when you felt that tugging on your heart, you were in a world of sin. Far from the peaceful shore within. I don't know what sin you were doing, but you was doing it good. I don't know which world you were living in, but you were living in it. And all of a sudden, in that place, you start to feel the tugging and the conviction of the Spirit of God. You start to feel like, hey, where I am, what I'm doing is not what I'm supposed to be doing. How I'm feeling is not how I'm supposed to be feeling. And you could, you could not quite put language to that thing that you were feeling on the inside, but you knew what you were feeling was calling you to come closer. What you were feeling on the inside was calling you to come up higher. And even though you did not know it was Jesus, even though you could not put in language that it was the spirit, you knew that it was something that was higher than you. I'm reminded of a story in the book of Daniel 4, when the, in Daniel 3, when the three Hebrew boys, when they were thrown in the fire. I'm talking about Jesus. They were thrown in the fire, and the king was trying to threaten them. He was intimidating them. And they said, oh, king, if God does not deliver us, we know that he is well able. But even if he does not, we will still worship him. They were thrown in the fire, and it says that they had their hats on, their capes on, their trousers on. They had everything on. It says nothing on them was burned because there was a fourth man that showed up in the fire and the scripture says he appeared he looked like the son of God and the question was asked how did they know what the son of God looked like one of the sons of this house who knows the scripture with great understanding and revelation brother Dean says you know it's not that they had ever seen him but we were created in his image and we were created in his likeness. And they saw something in that fire. They did not, they knew that they didn't, they, they knew that they did not put in that fire. And they said, that looks like a man. And it looks like the son of God. You may feel that conviction in your life and you may not know it's Jesus, but you, it bears witness with your soul. It is something on the inside of you that lets you know that this that I'm feeling, it feels like home. It feels like life. It feels like I need to get closer to this feeling that's calling me up higher. He convicts us. Here's the reason I want to focus on one as aspect of who Jesus is. Now, you know, Jesus was a very common name in the Bible. I can imagine Gabriel, who was doing this thing. He was the angel that God would give assignments to. He was the angel of fire and wind. He was the angel that delivered things. And God would send him a message. God would give him an assignment. And Gabriel would do it. And, 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 and God told Gabriel, I'm getting ready to be made man. I'm getting ready to come into the earth. And Gabriel was like, ooh. Before this, God only gave us a voice. He gave us a presence. He gave us a pillar of fire. And a, he gave us a cloud by day and a fire by night. He gave us all of these expressions. Oh, but now... You're coming into the world to be a man? And Gabriel, in all of his splendor, says, you're not going to even send an angel to do it? He's, he, he, Gabriel, I'm sure, and this is, my, this is my preaching mind, I'm pretty sure Gabriel was like, oh, you are, not even the heavens can contain you, and you're about to go into the earth? Surely you're going in as a ruling king. Surely you're going in as the general of all heaven. And God says, nope, I'm going in as a baby. Hold, hold up. A baby? 
Gabriel remembered because Gabriel, he assisted in, in the Nile experience when Moses had to be put in a basket to be shifted up to the river and he helped protect Moses. And he says, I know what a baby looks like. You're God. And you're coming into the world as a baby? Okay, you, you might be coming in as a baby, but surely your name is going to be Splendor. I mean, my name is Gabriel. That's, that's big. It's, it has bravado to it. It speaks to my abilities. What's gonna, what, what, what shall I tell the virgin to name you? Name me Jesus. Jesus? I mean, like, Jesus is like the common name, John. Jesus is like the common name. What are we, what's some common names today? Michael. Jamie. He says, you, you're the God of all heaven, and you want me to come. To, to you coming in the form of a child, a baby, into a virgin who is barely over puberty. She has pimples on her face, and you're going to allow the God of all the universe to kick the walls in her body and to come out into this world to be born in a manger, to spend your first day in a feeding trough, the God of all ages coming in the form of a baby, and you're not even coming into the palace. You're not coming with authority, but you're coming as a child. This is Emmanuel. God with us. And there's a reason why he chose not to come into a palace, because he could have came as a conquering king. There is a reason why he did not come as a war general, because he could have came and destroyed everything and brought right order. He says, I'm coming as a child because I want to understand that which I created. God with us. A lot of us like that word with. Come with me. Come with me to the store. Come with me to the hospital. Come with me to church. That is a language of presence, a language of being with someone. It is a presence. It is a presence driven term. It speaks of currency in the current state. Jesus says, I am Emmanuel, God with us. The Jesus of many people. <laughs> The Jesus of many people is small enough to put in a corner. Let me say that. I'm going to get back to my, to my, to my, to my text. Y'all got to give me at least 30 minutes today. If you're leaving, I'm telling them to lock the doors, okay? You ain't leaving. Lock all the doors. You're going to hear all this about Jesus today. We bought, segue, we bought Harper a fish. And we were really excited about this fish. And we put it in the corner. We would feed the fish every day. Harper ran to the fish, and she named it Bobby. And she, every time she came home from school, she would go over to Bobby. Either Jordan or me was feeding the fish. Pastor Ashley was feeding the fish, too. And the fish did everything that the fish was expected to do. It would swim around. It would come to the top when we fed the food. And it, 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 it did everything that it was supposed to do. After a while, we got bored with the fish. And we stopped paying attention to the fish. And what once was excited, we just left in the corner. And eventually we stopped feeding Bobby. And Bobby died. My sister comes to my house. And Harper says, Bobby dead. <laughs> Harper says, what did you just say? I know this might not seem really relevant to you all, but some of us treat Jesus like that fish. You were excited about him in the beginning. You were enamored with him. You see him, but all of a sudden, you want Jesus to be so small, you can just leave him in the corner. The Jesus of many people in this day and age can be contained in the corners of their lives. They package him up. Send him home with the kids. They dump him in the water. They're excited about him. But when the excitement leaves, they walk away from him. Everyone wants goldfish Jesus. Right? But if you do, you got to steer clear of the real Jesus. If you only see Jesus as this little small element of life that can be put in the corner, you don't know him like you think you know him. He brings wild rides to life. He comes at you like a fire hose, blasting and purging and cleansing. 
he will not swim quietly. He is more of force than a fixture, flushing away every last cloud of doubt in the life of those who accept him. I need to say that again. He is more of a force than a fixture. Jesus is not just a fixture. He is not a lucky charm trinket you put around your neck. He is not a chant or a good luck speech to say when you're in trouble, Jesus, help me, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. He is more than this subtle, discreet, uh, docile being that we've made him to be. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he changes everything. Now, Jesus doesn't promise to stop your snoring. He doesn't turn your kids into valedictorians or guarantee you will have to correct. The, he won't guarantee you have the correct lottery number because if he did, I would have it right now. Jesus doesn't make you skinny or clever. Jesus doesn't change what you see in the mirror. He only changes how you see what you see. Why did I have to go through all of that? Because that's what we've made Jesus to be. How can you, how can I, how can I make money, Jesus? How can I get my husband, Jesus? How can I get my wife, Jesus? How can I be successful in the world, Jesus? He says, you got it all wrong. You got it all wrong. What did Jesus do at the wedding party? He turned water into wine. He says, I'm going to turn it into wine. You just got to drink it. You have to do the work. He says, I'm going to show up. I'm going to be. I'm going to do. I'm going to come. But I need you to understand I change how you see things. He will not be silenced or predicted. He is the pastor who chased people out of the church. He is the prophet who had a soft spot for the crooks and the whores. He is the king who washed the grime off of the feet of his betrayers. And he turned a bread basket into a buffet and a dead friend into a living one. And most of all, he transformed the tomb into a womb out of which life was born for all of us. That's where your life began. When that tomb that once was full of dead men's corpses and dead men's bones, where he says, I'm no longer dead. Why are you searching for the living among the dead? For I am alive. Jesus, J-E-S-U-S, -S, what's his name? Thanks, you used to tell my mother. My mother still said today, I'd be talking to her on the phone, and I'd just be talking to her, and she wanted to pray to the baby. But the more you call them, the better you feel. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, mother. I appreciate it. Jesus, five letters, six hours, one cross, three nails. We live because he does, hope because of his works, and matter because he matters. To be saved by grace is to be saved by him. When you're saved by grace, you're not saved by an idea, you're not saved by a doctrine, you're not saved by a creed or even a church membership, but by Jesus himself, who will sweep into heaven anyone who so much as gives him the nod to say yes. Goldfish Jesus, not on your life. As I was preparing this, my preaching style is usually very I do outlines or I am inspired in revelation. God says, take time to write about me. He says, I want you to take pen to paper and I want you to write. Well, not really pen to paper. I took my iPad. I was typing pretty much. I try to be very literal. He says, I want you to take time to write me out because oftentimes you forget who I am in your life. Has any of us ever put more faith in ourselves and our circumstances, and our fears than we have in Jesus. When we do that, we fail to remember who lives on the inside of us. Goldfish Jesus only happens on Christmas and Easter. The real Jesus is like a ticking clock. He claims every tick and tock of our lives. Goldfish Jesus winks at sin, where the real Jesus make the real Jesus nukes it. He kills it. Goldfish Jesus is a lucky charm crucifix on the necklace, but Jesus is a lion in the heart of the believer. Do you know this Jesus? 
If your answer is no, let's talk about him. If your answer is yes, let's talk about him. Let's talk about Jesus. And let's begin where the earthly ministry of Jesus began, in the womb of Mary. The God of the universe, for a time, kicked against the walls of that woman's womb. He was born in the poverty of a peasant and spent his first night in the feeding trough of a cow. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood, according to John 1, 14, in the message version. Didn't have, he, he didn't have to. He decided to. Jesus could have become a voice, a voice in the air. He could have become a message, a message in the sky. He even could have became a light, a light in the night, but he became more. So much more, he became flesh. Why? Why did he take the journey? Why did he go so far to become flesh? I want to let you know that the answer lies very closely. Could the answer be he did it for you? Jesus came near to you, and any concerns you might have about his power and love were removed from the discussion the moment he became flesh and entered the world. What a beginning. What an entrance. What a moment. That does not sound like a goldfish Jesus. That sounds like the lion of the tribe of Judah. Emmanuel. I'm describing Jesus. Based on this, it seems like we have a lot in common with Jesus. He was born to a mother, acquainted with physical pain, enjoys a good party, rejected by friends, unfairly accused. He loves stories, reluctantly pays taxes. Let the church say amen. It's tax time. Hope y'all ain't claiming kids that ain't yours. I'm just joking, sort of. He's turned off by greedy religion. Does anybody turn off by greedy religion? Anybody turned off by empty religion? He was unappreciated by his siblings. Stands up for the underdog. Kept awake at night by his concerns. Known to doze off in the midst of trips, that's me. Accused of being too rowdy and afraid. He was not afraid of death. Actually, at one point in the garden, he says, if it's possible, let this cup pass by me. There was a moment I was like, you sure? He was afraid of death even at a moment. Oftentimes, we remove the, the humanity of Christ, and we see him as this sort of being, tortitium being. This, it's the, the terminology is tortitium, it's just an other thing. We see him floating like a ghost, but he was real man, walking the earth. He had to experience. This is the reason why he came as a baby. It says that Jesus had to grow. He had to grow in understanding. He had to be submitted. Could you imagine the strength? This, this is for all of us gifted people. This is for all of us brilliant people. This is for all of our people, all these people who've been saved for 25 years and you think you know it all. This is for all of us who have been there, done it. The God of all heaven lowered himself to be a child, a boy, and submitted himself to a carpenter. Who did that pastor think he is? I know it all. I done been doing this, and he ain't. If Jesus can submit, if, if the God of the universe can submit to a carpenter, surely you can submit to a pastor. Ooh, I'm about to throw this mic and hit the wall. I don't care. Jesus. God left glory. And he came to live among men. Could you imagine the downgrade that he had to experience? God downgraded himself from eternity to being confined to a body, from never experiencing pain or feeling to having to experience his feet hurting because he'd been walking the dusty roads, from having righteous indignation to now getting irritated with a group of men that he spent so much time with them because they just didn't get it. He learned to submit to a place and to a man that he created. Now we're talking about pride and ego. If anybody had the right to have pride and ego, it would be the God of all heaven and the man named Jesus. If anybody had the right to say, I don't have to do this. I don't have to go through this process. I don't have to submit. It would be the one who created everything. But it says that Jesus grew. He grew. 
He grew, in, he grew in submission. He grew in understanding. He grew in learning because he says, I am with them. He says, I want to be able to relate. I want to be able to feel. I want to be able to know. So he says, let me come as the form of a man. Hebrews 4 and 15 says, Jesus understands our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. If Jesus understands our weaknesses, then so does God. Jesus was God in human form, and he was God with us. That is why Jesus is called Emmanuel. Emmanuel appears in the same Hebrew form as it did 2,000 years ago. Emmanuel means with us. El refers to Elohim or God. So Emmanuel is not above us, God. It's not somewhere, God. It's not he's somewhere in the neighborhood. He came as the with us, God. Very personal. Very pride. Very, he is God with us. He's not God above us. He's not God around us. He is God with us. All of us, Russians, Germans, Africans, Hebrews, he is God with us. He says, I am with you always. Jesus said before he ascended to heaven to the very end of the age in Matthew 28 and 20. He says, search. He, he says, I will be with you until the end of the age. There is no restriction in that word with. There is no restriction. There is no caveats to that word with. That word with is a sustaining with. I will be with you. That with is not circumstantial. He does not abandon you. That is the type of Jesus he is. Now, this, I'm about to say something controversial. We've seen something that God has never seen. Sometimes we see people as hopeless. God has never seen them as hopeless. Sometimes we see people as being unredeemable. Jesus has never seen a soul that he has deemed unredeemable. Sometimes we see people as lost causes. He's never, ever seen someone as lost cause. You could search the gospels through and through, letter by letter, line upon line, precept upon precept. You will never see a moment where Jesus did not say, I will be with you. Now, what he does is he gives people the opportunity to make their decisions and their choices. He is not, once again, fishbowl Jesus. He is the Jesus that when a rich young ruler would come to him, he says, hey, I've done everything I need to do. I followed all of the commandments. I followed all of the law. And Jesus says, sounds good. I love Jesus. You know, he's able to discern. He, 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 he sees through all of the fluff. Jesus always saw through all of the fluff, and, and I pray that I can have an eye like Jesus, that I'm able to discern the thoughts and the intents of the hearts of men so that I can decide and discern where to spend the time and where not to spend the time. Jesus says, that sounds good, go give, go give away all your riches. What did the rich young ruler do? It says, he had this look on his face, and he turned and walked away. Some would say, well, Jesus was not with him. Yes, he was. But Jesus wants to be with you so much that he wants you to be. He became one of us so that we can be with him. He lowered himself so that we can be with him. God is with us. Prophets weren't enough. Apostles wouldn't do. Angels would not suffice. God sent more than a miracle and a message. He sent himself. He sent his son. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. For thousands of years, God gave us his voice. Prior to Bethlehem, he gave us a messenger. He gave us teachers. He gave us words. But in the manger, he gave us himself. I imagine that when God is with us, he is the son of God. I imagine God with us, Emmanuel, that this is a very reason why we are able to overcome sin, why we are able to overcome death, hell, and the grave, because God is with us. And the very one that is with us, the very one that is on the inside of us, he is the redeemer and he is the, omnip the omnipotent one. What does that word omnipotent mean? It means all-powerful. The all-powerful one is with us.